Now that we've um, completed the analysis of a transmission line that's terminated a load and one that has a, a source uh, likewise connected to the other uh, end of that transmission line, we have a complete circuit. Let's go back and take our results and see uh, what they mean in terms of the rate of energy flow, the power uh, that is associated with uh, the transmission line connecting source and load. The first thing we know is because the, uh, well, the first power, I should say, that we consider here is the power delivered from the source. So that's the rate that which energy is flowing out of the source, how many millijoules per second. Second <coughs> power we consider is the absorbed power by the load, the rate at which energy is crossing the plane at the end of the transmission line and therefore uh, entering the uh, load impedance the uh, and ultimately being absorbed by whatever device this represents. Of course, this two-port device, which is our transmission line, which is inserted between our source and the load, is a lossless two-port device. And because it's lossless, we know it cannot alter the rate of energy flow. The rate at which energy is flowing into the two-port device, if it's lossless, must be equal to the rate at which energy is flowing out of that two port device and <clears throat> therefore because our transmission line is lossless we conclude by conservation of energy that the power absorbed by this load will be equal to the power delivered by this source along the transmission line we earlier did an analysis of the rate of energy flow the power and we found there were two terms one which we uh, ascribed to the power associated with the plus going electromagnetic wave and the other we um, associated with the power of the minus going electromagnetic wave so p plus and p minus where the uh, p plus is uh, proportional to the magnitude squared of the complex wave amplitude v0 plus p minus is likewise uh, proportionally, uh, proportionally related to its complex wave amplitude, in this case, V0 minus. And again, these are the power associated with each wave for the two waves, the plus wave and the minus wave. Of course, the difference between these two is the net power flow across any and every port uh, point on our transmission line, a uh, port plane uh, uh, that we define by some index Z, we find that the rate at which energy is passing excuse me, passing by is the net energy flow, which is the difference between these two. All right, since we have a complete circuit now with both the source and a load on our transmission line, we're going to change the uh, notation a little bit and give a different name to our plus going wave. Instead of calling it the plus wave or the electromagnetic wave propagating in the direction of increasing Z, we are now going to uh, describe the wave in relation to the load. And so we call the plus wave now, we're gonna call it the incident wave, meaning that it's incident on this load at the end of the transmission line. So instead of calling it P plus, we're gonna call it P incident. It's the same thing, it has the same value as before, we're just changing the name. Likewise, for the minus wave, instead of saying the wave, electromagnetic wave propagating the direction of decreasing Z, we're going to call that wave and the corresponding power the reflected wave and thus the reflected power. So instead of P minus, we're going to have the reflected power here. And uh, it's equal to the same value as before, uh, proportional to the magnitude squared of V0 minus. So we have incident power flowing from the source to the load and reflected power that is associated the wave flowing from the load back to the source. Again, we have to be careful here to not try to so assign causality uh, to these. The students oftentimes uh, want to say that the incident wave is, uh, you know, due to the source. And once we talked about earlier, certainly if we didn't have a source, we wouldn't have no, we would have no incident wave. But the power associated with the incident wave is dependent on both the source and the value of the load. Likewise, the value of the reflected power or reflected wave is uh, ultimately dependent on both the load impedance and likewise the source impedance and the source voltage. So um, we just have two uh, electromagnetic waves and again one were called incident and one were called uh, reflected uh, but we uh, try not 
uh, try not to assign directly causality of the incident wave with this with respect to the source or the reflected wave with respect to the load again they um, uh, they interact together uh, to simultaneously satisfy the boundary condition on either end of our transmission line so how are this how are this incident power and reflective power related to each other before we just when we didn't have anything connected to our transmission line we just talked about plus power and minus power now that we have connected devices to either end we can give some relationship between these powers uh, the first uh, relationship comes from our first boundary condition when we connect a load at the end recall from that boundary condition we found <coughs> excuse me the reflection coefficient function at the end of the transmission line at z is equal to zero must be equal to the load reflection coefficient of the load connected there so gamma zero is equal to gamma l that was our boundary condition and of course gamma zero is defined as the ratio between v zero minus and v zero plus and therefore, because of this equality due to the boundary condition, we can relate V0 minus to V0 plus through this load reflection coefficient gamma L. And that relation is ship is uh, shown here. V0 minus is equal to V0 plus times gamma L. This is useful when we go when we try to determine the uh, power associated with each wave. So for more specifically, the reflected power, uh, we know the reflected power is in terms of V0 minus. We've just now turned, uh, described V0 minus in terms of V0 plus. We insert that relationship here. Remember, the magnitude of the product of two complex numbers is the product of the magnitudes. And so we can separate them and we get this result. But this, of course, is the incident power. And so we can say that the reflected power is simply the incident power times the magnitude squared of gamma L. If we take the ratio of reflected power to incident power, uh, what we can say is essentially that is uh, that ratio is equal to the magnitude squared of gamma L. The magnitude squared of gamma L tells us the percentage of the incident wave that is reflected. If the magnitude squared of gamma L is equal to 0.3, that means... 30% of the incident wave is reflected. So to state that mathematically, again, the ratio of the reflected power to the incident power is equal to the magnitude squared of the reflection load reflection coefficient. And of course, that load reflection coefficient now is equal to this. There should be a squared there. I realize there should uh, left the square off there. <clears throat> um, um, but if we find that, well, of course, the uh, characteristic impedance C0 is a positive real value. And if the resistive component of ZL, the real part of ZL, is likewise real and positive, which it must be if the load is going to be passive, we can show mathematically that the magnitude of this, and therefore the magnitude squared of this, is going to be less than or equal to 1. So in other words, this value, the ratio of reflected uh, power to incident power uh, must be a value that's less than or equal to one. That means that the reflected power could be anywhere between zero and the at its maximum, the value of the incident power. Um, so again, enforces the condition here where this magnitude of gamma L squared really tells us the percentage of the incident power that's reflected. If it's 0.8, then 80% is. If it's equal to 1, which it can be, that means 100% of the incident power is reflected. And so from this, we can conclude that the incident power is always going to be greater than or equal to the reflected power. We have therefore uh, talked about um, the power delivered by the source and the power absorbed by the load. And we have, have made the argument that because the transmission line is lossless, that these two must be equal to each other. These two power values are equal to each other. Then we went through, we looked at reflected power and incident power, and we determined how they were related to each other. They're related to each other by the magnitude squared of the load reflection coefficient. The question then is how is the uh, reflected and incident power related to the delivered and absorbed power? Can we use um, some 
uh, argument to determine the relationship between those pairs. And it turns out we can. We use conservation of energy. The first thing we're going to do is recognize that the net power flow along our transmission line, which is the physical power flow. If I draw a line through our transmission line and view uh, at what rate energy is passing by, 63.2 millijoules per second, that is the net power flow. And that has to be the difference between the incident power heading toward the load and the reflected power heading away from the load. The net power is the difference between the incident and the reflected. And that net power is the same at every location on this lossless transmission line. Remember this net power flow, since the transmission line is lossless, cannot be either increased nor decreased uh, as we move uh, along the line. Because of that, we find that the incident power if you look at this equation, the incident power is equal to the net power plus the reflected power. Again, all these powers are positive, and so that means the incident power is greater than the uh, reflected power. Um, I think actually what I wanted to say there was the incident power is greater than the net power flow greater than or equal to rather the net power flow. Uh, we de determined on the, on the previous slide that the incident power is greater than or equal to the reflected power. Um, also, it is greater than or equal to the net power flow. So the net rate of energy flow we just said, as we just said, is constant along the transmission line. Uh, wherever we draw, draw a port plane, we see that the rate of energy of flow across it is precisely the same, regardless of where we draw the port plane. Of course, this includes the very beginning of the transmission line and the very end of the transmission line. Let's look at the very beginning of the transmission line. If we find right there at the beginning of this transmission line, the net power flow is 63.4 millijoules per second, what we conclude by conservation of energy is that the delivered power of the source is equal to 63.4 uh, millijoules per second. Uh, again, think about that carefully. The net power flow, this is the physical flow uh, along the transmission line. If we deliver energy at a rate of 32.7 millijoules per second from the source, at any point on the transmission line, there'll be a net power flow of 32.7 millijoules per second. And of course, that then would be absorbed by the load on the other end. And so we can say that the delivered power of the source is equal to the net power flow. And the net power flow is equal to the difference between the incident and the reflected power. And so this is a very important uh, uh, result that we have here. The delivered power is equal to the difference between the incident and reflected powers. The incident power, therefore, can be rewritten in this form. It is the sum of the delivered power from the source plus the reflected power from the load. From this, we conclude the incident power is greater than or equal to the power delivered from the source. Likewise, the incident power, as we've earlier determined, the incident power is greater than or equal to the reflected power. Now, I want to go back and look at this statement right here, because this causes great confusion for students, and oftentimes this is done incorrectly. The incident power, the power of the wave flowing from the source down to the load, is greater than the power delivered by the source. And I emphasize this because uh, students frequently say that the incident power is equal to the delivered power uh, from the source. And again, this gets back to sort of the causality argument here that uh, the source is launching this incident wave. And so uh, whatever the power associated with the incident wave is, it must be the power that's being delivered by the source. But no, we have two rates, two uh, rates of power of energy flow in our transmission line, one down the line and one back up. The net is the difference between the two. And the net, the difference between the incident and the reflected, the net power flow at any point is what, by conservation of energy, the power delivered by the source must be equal to. So if the incident power right here were 100 millijoules per second and the reflected power were 80 millijoules per second. We had 80 millijoules coming back the other way. Well, the net is 20 millijoules per second. Where's that 20 millijoules second per second coming from? It's coming from the source. The source is not delivering 100 milliwatts. The source is delivering 20 milliwatts in that example. So make sure that you get this straight. We, of course, can make the same argument at the other end of the transmission line. 
down here where the uh, load is connected to the end of the transmission line. What is the net power flow right here at the end of the transmission line? Well, it's the same as the net power flow everywhere on the transmission line. It's the difference between the incident and reflected power. So at this point, we find the net power flow by conservation of energy, the rate at which energy is flowing out of our transmission line. That energy must be, by conservation of energy, being uh, being absorbed by this load impedance or the device or system that that impedance represents. <clears throat> and so we say the difference between incident and reflected, the net power flow, is equal to the power that must be absorbed by the load. And so you see a nice symmetry here. We said the delivered power must be equal to the net power, the difference between incident and reflected. And we say the absorbed power must be equal to the net power, the difference between incident and reflected. But of course, we know that by conservation of energy, the delivered power must be equal to the absorbed power when the device is lossless between it. In this case, it is. <clears throat> and so all of our statements align and are consistent. We can combine them all together here and come up with this very important statement. This is really the uh, conservation of energy statement of the four power that is so four powers that are associated with uh, our transmission line circuit, a source, a transmission line, and a load. And that is that the deliver power of the source is equal to the net power flow along the transmission line, the difference between the incident and reflected, and that likewise must be equal to the power absorbed by the load at the other end. Delivered power is equal to the absorbed power. The delivered power is equal to the net power. The net power is equal to the absorbed power. The only thing you really have to remember is that the net power is the difference between the incident and reflected power. If we go back up here and look at this equation, we can rewrite it in this form. The incident power is equal to the absorbed power plus the reflected power. <clears throat> and that means when you look at it, that the incident power must be greater than equal, greater than or equal to the absorbed power. And the incident power must be, of course, greater than or equal to the reflected power, as we've seen before. Since each of these values are positive, real and po positive here, it turns out that the incident power must always be uh, the largest of these four. Now, there are times, let's say, when the reflected power is equal to zero, where the incident power is equal to the delivered, the delivered is equal to the incident, or the absorbed is equal to the incident. But there's no ca case where uh, any of the other three powers, delivered, reflected, or absorbed, could be greater than the incident. The incident is the largest. Again, the incident power is not the power delivered by the source. The incident power minus the reflected power is the power that is delivered by the source. Don't make that mistake. So this slide is simply a, a summary of what I've been trying to uh, emphasize all along here, that the incident power is of uh, along the transmission line is greater than or equal to the power delivered by the source. It's not equal to the power delivered by the source. Oftentimes, again, students incorrectly assume that that is the case, but go back and look at the math and the rationale, the conservation of energy, and you'll see clearly that the incident power in general is going to be bigger than the delivered power. And it's pretty evident that the only time that the uh, deliver power is the same as the incident power is if there is no reflected power uh, from the uh, from the load at the end. Um, so again, make sure you think about that and make it make sense to you. Um, uh, the delivered power is not equal to the incident power, generally speaking. So another way of looking at this is to uh, recast our math instead of uh, instead of uh, incident and reflected power. Let's uh, talk about the reflected power in terms of the incident power and the magnitude squared of the load reflection coefficient. And so we can say the delivered power is related to the incident power with this direct equation where we use the magnitude squared of, uh, of gamma L there. Notice here, remember, the magnitude squared of gamma L can go from 0 to 1. If the value is 0, then that is the one case where the delivered power is equal to the incident power. But if it's greater than 0, which it generally is, then we find the delivered power is going to be less than the incident power. Notice this can all go all the way up to a maximum value of 1. And in that case, we find that the delivered power would be equal, I'm sorry, the delivered power would be equal to 0. Sometimes student has, students have a hard time believing that we could have a source that delivers uh, uh, no power. But uh, in fact, we can. And the, the condition is when the gamma L, the magnitude of gamma L, is equal to 1. Under that condition, the reflected power is just as big as the incident power, which means the net power flow is equal to 0. If the net power flow is equal to 0, 
It means the load is not absorbing any energy. It means the source, likewise, is not delivering any energy. So we have two extremes from the case where the uh, uh, delivered power is equal to the incident to the case where the delivered power is equal to zero. And generally, generally speaking, the delivered power is less than the incident power. All right, so um, I tried to make it very clear um, the summary of, uh, of this presentation. Uh, I write them very large and put them in red boxes because uh, students oftentimes um, uh, really struggle with trying to implement this. It's a very simple, very simple relationship. Um, but what it gets down to really is what do these subscripts mean? Physically, what do they represent? If you understand what they physically represent in conservation of energy, then this equation is is uh, is obvious and it's not uh, anything you need to write down it's it's uh, an obvious statement of the physical truth um if you're not aware what's the what's the delivered power and what's the incident power and what's the difference in absorb or reflected if you're kind of confused by that physically what these things represent physically um then that's why i think students struggle with the math so make sure you go through and look at this and uh, make this make sense to you um you could say, oh, I'll just write it down. But again, that's not going to help if you don't know what ABS means or REF or INC or DEL. This is really a statement of a physical truth here, and you need to make sure you understand that physical truth. One of the ramifications of this is the incident power along our transmission line is greater than or equal to the delivered power of the source. And again, emphasize this because I get equalities here all the time that the, the source uh, delivers energy in there and that's the incident wave. Um, no, the energy delivers in there is the difference between the incident and the reflected. Otherwise, conservation of energy would not be uh, would not be satisfied.